Alright, hi guys. Why don't you just go around the table and introduce yourself so we can get used to your voice. We will start with me. I am Captain Awesome. Henceforth, refer to me as Captain Awesome. Also, Brent Ullman. <laughs> Gary Wehrkamp. Captain Awesome? What? <laughs> you heard that, huh? <laughs> uh, Eric Daggert. Joe Navolo. Carl Cadden James. All right, guys, we know the big news is you have your first live shows coming up here in September and then European tour in October, but let's start at the beginning. Will someone like to give me the very brief history of Shadow Gallery? Captain Awesome. Brief history, here it comes. He doesn't know uh, brief, he doesn't know the history, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there once was this Lehigh Valley cover band named Sorcerer, and they played a bunch of Ingve and Rush and all sorts of other noodling things like that. Um, and that was the nucleus uh, of what became Shadow Gallery uh, after I joined the band in 1989, or was it 90? I don't remember. Um, I was young. I used to be young at one point. So I think at that point, uh, when I joined, they had just stopped playing out and uh, were working on like a little four-track demo or whatever of some of their songs that they were doing. And I heard it and thought, wow, this is pretty cool. You know, it kind of sounded like Queensryche and Ingve kind of mished up together. Um, Carl and I decided we wanted to write some songs, and the first thing we wrote was The Queen of the City of Ice, which was the longest song I think we did, right? Really long, right? It's like 20 minutes or something? 17. Something like that. And uh feels like two Who's hours. Counting? But it turned out so good it was like hey you know this is we, we may we may have something here why don't we keep doing that and uh chris ingles kind of came back into the band he used to play with sorcerer and when i met chris it was we just hit it off everything we wrote we loved we didn't i don't think we wrote anything that we didn't use somewhere at any point there was no throwaway material so because it was that cool to us anyways um so we started uh putting together you know, as many songs as we could. Uh, the guy playing drums for us at the time, his name was John Cooney. He sent off a, uh, unbeknownst to us, he sent off a uh, a tape of it to uh, Mike Varney at Shrapnel Records. That's us trying to kill a fly in that. <laughs> <laughs> the video will know what's going on. The audio has to know they were killing a fly. Yeah, Gary was a success. <laughs> <Mosquito. Mosquito. laughs> no, so this is a yeah, bad bug. We can kill bad bugs. So, um... He John sent off a, a, a tape to Mike Varney Shrapnel Records. Mike Varney called Carl. Carl knew who he was immediately, and then called us all up, and we kind of freaked out like little girls. Um, and uh, <laughs> so they were working on a new on a new uh, progressive rock label that was similar to his Shrapnel Records. Um, and I had like every Shrapnel record ever, you know, at the time. Steeler. Yeah, all that stuff. Um, Steeler, Vinnie Moore, Tony McAlpine, all that stuff. And um, so we said, okay, we'll write some more of this just, you know, for you guys because they were interested in it. And what we ended up coming up with was our first record. So that was our demo tape, complete with not so awesome drum programming on a very, what was it, Aliasis? Aliasis HR16. Aliasis HR16. And half the buttons were broke when I was done with it. And um, Magna Carta got it signed us to a pretty awful contract and then uh, put it out and uh, so please be honest yeah. <laughs> so and, and put it out so, I'm just and, glad and, he's being brief that's all I'm done <laughs> I'm working on it that's essentially the brief history now, now I'll cut in here for one quick question something somebody wanted me to ask was would you guys ever consider re-recording drums for that first album I would and, love to do that but I don't want the legal headache yeah <laughs> the, the legal that comes along with it and um, it was recorded on a Tascam eight track reel to reel, and God knows where that it's is. Gone. I, I took um, those master two inch tapes, transferred them to ADAT to save it. But now the ADAT tapes are bad too. So <laughs> they're just gone. I bought us done. ten more years to do nothing. We, yeah, we would have to actually, uh, we would have to actually re-record everything from scratch, which I'm not opposed to. Okay. Um, how did things change in the band for Carbs and Stone when Gary came in? Gary was a lifesaver because at that point Chris needed to take a break from the music industry essentially and took it and we were left with nobody to uh, do those incredible keyboard parts that we needed to have done and after lots of prayer and a lot of luck 
this goofy, skinny little guy came walking in with his beat up guitar and his nice. tiny little Thank PDM. You. Skinny? I didn't think you were talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one you point need to you love me in your skinny. band. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, come on, man. Yeah, but I didn't join the band to replace Chris. No, at first, yeah, first, at first, Gary was just going to kind of be a side man when we were going to do our uh, tour for the first. <laughs> wait a minute, that wait a minute. Working on. Let's, no, wait, let's start we're again. Gonna, we were going to pay you to pay. It'd be, and it was like after a lot of conversation, this guy's way too good to let him go anywhere else. He's way too good to pay any money. <laughs> way too good to pay any money that we don't have. So. Uh, yeah, luckily Gary joined the band for Carbon Stone, and 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 he was uh, responsible for doing the most um, thing that the, the thing that that's most known about that record, I think, or the best part about it is all the little segues that tie all the tunes together, right? That's all Gary. Okay. He just made his little noodling things, and they turned out great. So, and thank God for it, you know what I mean? Because it was. We totally needed him, and he showed up at the right place at the right oh, time. We, we are blessed in that God sends us the right people at the right times in our lives. I can already tell that once you guys hit Europe, you're gonna either going to end up killing each other or having the best time of your lives. Uh, you know what? Let me, I'd, I'd stop a bullet for anybody in this room, except for you, Nick. I don't know you that well. <laughs> <laughs> we won't shoot you, so... <laughs> I might push you out of the way. <laughs> Thank you. All right, a little more back history here. Why don't you just go around and just tell us when you did those first two albums, you're just starting out, who, who were some of the people then influencing you individually as players? Queensryche and Ingrake. Queensryche is a, is a vocal band, and uh, Ingrake is a bass player. Yeah, Ingrake was a great bass player. I was into the, really the heavy, heavy stuff. I mean, I came from... From Dallas, where the speed metal stuff was really popular at the time, the whole Pantera thing, and that kind of Metallica was huge and all that. So I, I had that coming from me, and then a little bit of, of the, the jazz and progressive rock like Kansas and whatnot. I was into the heavier stuff, too, coming out of a, a lot of cover bands doing Metallica type stuff. But it was also very much into Yngwie, Rush, Pink Floyd. Really big into Pink Floyd at that time. Uh, see, I was into like Mahavishnu Orchestra... Uh, Buddy Rich, uh, Terry Bozio, as far as drummers. Buddy Holly. Who's who? Buddy Holly. Buddy Holly? Oh, yeah, he's one of my favorites. <laughs> you mean Weezer? <laughs> Weezer's cover, Buddy Holly? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, jazz, rock, and I, I like Zeppelin and Yes, you know, that band. Like now, Carl, you, you had mentioned Queens, right? So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Since Brian couldn't be here with us, now, he, he has been, I've seen more than once, compared to Jeff Tate. Now, is that something you embrace that you are okay with, or do you try and maybe get some identity away from that, or do you not think about it? Well, essentially I don't think about it, because having worked with him enough, he's very much distanced himself from Jeff Tate for me. He sounds, he's an imitator. I've heard, he can do the best Bond Scott you've ever heard. Best Ozzy I've ever heard. It's hilarious, too. Yes. You would close your eyes and go, this is ridiculous. As much as he sounds like Jeff Tate, he can sound like anybody. I've heard him sing Joe Elliott and go, that's Joe Elliott. You know? So I, I don't really think about it, but stepping back, when uh, we decided we wanted to move on past Mike and actually do complete you know, our new thing, I really, in my... You know, in my mind, I still go back to the night that I saw Rage for Order at Lemoore's in Queens, and and that I walked away with going, that's the best metal singer I have ever seen. This is the best vocal performance I have ever stood in front of in my life, and I just want something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I had actually gone, I was looking hard, and I, I found something that sounded like Jeff Tate down in Florida, our age, uh, just left a popular Christian metal band and I was like I called Gary and said I found a dude man I, I want a dude like this this would be great so good but then hmm, we but, didn't use him but I didn't like that dude I didn't like that dude <laughs> <laughs> but Gary didn't like him and, and ultimately speak, the way I look at it is that well you know if we could have you know if he's got to sound like somebody I'd rather him sound like Jeff Tate than you know Kurt Cobain so True. Put me down for the Jeff Tate. He doesn't have time. a very good voice these days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, not just talking about Digital Ghost, but in general, when you guys get together to write, record an album, how does it happen? Where, where does the magic start? In there. 
<laughs> Pointing to the garage. G- Gary's the garage. <laughs> it's not a garage. It's just my <laughs> studio. Different, different, different places, you know. I, I'm sorry. It's, it's protruding off the side of a house. It starts there in the shed. We start, you know, cutting the grass, and you no, know, we just try to convince ourselves that we're going to have the time to do another record. That's how it, where it starts, I think, honestly. And then once we fool ourselves into thinking, well, maybe we can, we just start demoing music. Um, Brent, we all have the capability to record in our own homes. We all, all have studios. So we'll start just some demos with some drum programming and uh, just kind of pass the ideas around and then uh, make the way to Carl. He starts adding vocals and lyrics, and then we go back and forth with changing it and kind of crafting it together. So then the music pretty much always comes before the, the vocals and all that? Uh, mostly, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's just an idea. You know, yeah. Sometimes you'll get Carl on the phone going, Write a Gamma Ray song! <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> you know, and so that sort of thing kind of happens. And could just be an idea. Okay. You know? Yeah, you're right. A lot of ideas start start the album. For me, I, I wanted to do Cliffhanger Part 3. I just thought it would be an idea, like things to do on a new album. And uh, so I tried to write something with that riff in it, and then it ended up becoming pain. But, you know, it was the idea that got it started, you know, so the starting point. Okay. Now, all, all of you guys pretty much, for the most part, are multi-instrumentalists. When you all come together, how, how do you decide who's going to end up doing what on the album? Is there any <coughs> difficulties there? Not really. I mean... Actually, it's more like, can you please do this <laughs> instead? Instead of I want to do this, it's more like beg the other guys. To yeah, do it. it's like, like Gary, I'll do a can demo. You please just do a solo on this because I don't feel like it. I'll do a demo and I'll say, Brent, take this and make it better, and then he doesn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. That's, that's kind of how it is. Everybody, we all have our own little spaces to shine, man. So, okay. you know. If there's a tune that I don't play on, you know, lead guitar or something like that, I'm whatever. It's it's all good. He doesn't want to listen. He doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> that little known secret. Say something like, "What about the song Spoken Words?" And he'll go, "Huh?" <laughs> He's never even heard it. In yeah, I don't know. How he doesn't know songs. any of the things that he didn't write. Let me say that my my two favorite songs that we have written, I, I didn't write a, a note of. Hmm. So. And what would those be? Uh, that would be Vow and Haunted. Okay. Now, uh, Digital Ghost had a few guests on it, which we'll talk about later, and in the past you guys have had DC Cooper, James LeBray on your records. Any chance of those guys coming back in the future, or um, anyone else you'd like to work with specifically? Hmm. You know, that question usually gets answered a little down the line. Um, you know, we don't kind of make a list. Like Arion, you know, he makes his list of singers and has a great pool of talent to choose from. We kind of start with who we have, and things just kind of come up, you know? Okay. But I would love, love, love to for Dan and Nancy Wilson. Ooh, we should uh, have yeah. Jeff Tate on one of our albums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. A Jeff Tate good vocals no, I guess. I just saw Hart. Oh. 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 Uh oh. I think Carl needs to change his underwear. That was, that was my bucket list band, man. That was the one band that I never saw that I, I had to it. see before I died. Are we good? And I did. No, right. They played "Love Rain or Me" by the Who for their closing oh, wow. songs. It, and Wilson is just thinking about how. Yeah, awesome she's she gonna be the she's gonna be the best singer that ever lived, man. <clears throat> and Nancy, she was just a rock star. She looked fantastic. She moved like a rock star. Wow. Played great. All right, now Carl, you had mentioned about Queens Reich, and and it's obvious that you guys had some classic progressive metal influences in the band when you started out. Is there anybody today, newer bands, that you guys find yourselves being influenced by that you guys like listening to? Miley Cyrus, right? A little bit. <laughs> yeah, Miley Cyrus. Uh, who's that Justin guy? What's his name? <laughs> the Johnny's brother. Yeah, that Jonas, yeah, that guy. No, um, I don't listen to progressive rock. Yeah. No? I rarely listen to it at all. I, I mostly just listen to jazz. Although I really like the new Muse album, The Resistance. Really, really good. <laughs> See, that's funny. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Muse, but actually the new album was kind of iffy on me. Really? I love the thing, man. It's, that was just awesome. I'm a bad guy to ask that question to, Gary. Yeah, you know, I don't even listen to music. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, I listen to what we're yeah. working on or whatever I'm producing <laughs> or whatever I have to, you know? Joe, tell me you listen to some music. Well, I, listen, I'm, I'm a drum teacher. I have a school. And uh, okay. all the kids that come in, you know, the adult that? drum students come in, and they bring, you know, a lot of material. But as far as uh, 
what new bands that I like. I don't know. I really can't think of it. It's the same way. <laughs> We're all just old farts that listen yeah, to the stuff yeah. we grew up listening to. That's it. I like to put yeah, on. I'll put on Iron Maiden and listen yes, to that all rush. day for a week. Yeah, yeah. Queen's never too far from <laughs> what I'm grabbing and putting on. Yeah, yeah as far as new bands, I really like Pagan's Mind. I don't know how new they are, but oh, yeah, they're man, great. They're great. They're That's really, really phenomenal. good. Phenomenal. And uh, what's his name? Oh, him. Jack. The dude, name? you gave me his CD. Devin oh, Devin, Townsend. yeah. Devin's the best. I have, he's Do the I best. I love that stuff a lot. That's it. That's that's my yeah. pick. Devin Townsend. That's my favorite. Yeah, I think it is so friggin' I good. I have heard of him. Oh, it's mind blowingly good. It's, good. it's good. ridiculous. It's so yeah, it's completely awesome. Yeah. Best best album in the last two years, uh, I think. Say what? <laughs> right, now here here's one for Carl over here. A lot of your lyrics tend to border on the, the sci fi or the fantasy related, especially build the story at Tyranny in Room Five. Yet they also tie into the modern day. Where where do you get the inspiration to do kind of that merging I and mean, get the inspiration for your lyrics? Um do you have time for this? We don't have time for that. Well, maybe. The, the list of resources <laughs> that I drew from um, for the Tyranny Room 5 story is extensive. Extensive. But, uh, to be brief, um, Tyranny um, was very much influenced by an internet book called uh, Feudalism, Al Alias American Capitalism. The author's name is David. doesn't give his last name. And it essentially, it's a, um, from the early 80s to the late 80s, he took snippets of things in all the major international financial publications and put them together in a contiguous form that was, was eye-opening to me. And that was kind of the basis for a tyranny. Um, Room 5 was very much influenced by, uh, um... The Dan Brown couple of books, Digital Fortress, and The Da Vinci Code, um, and uh, very much by Richard Preston's um, nonfiction, Demon in the Freezer, about yeah. the uh, 50 tons of weaponized smallpox that were stolen or sold off out of Russia. Absolute true story. I love that book. Love that book. Most terrifying Freaking. thing you will ever read, ever. I, you know what? Um, like, read The Hot Zone about the Ebola outbreak and the monkey containment facility in Reston, Virginia. Scary book. Really, really scary book. And I thought, well, nothing's going to top that. And then I read Demon in the Freezer and a uh, bioweapons engineer from Russia at a conference in Paris defects to the British consulate and says, we've Just got true weaponized stuff. smallpox. He was immediately taken to MI6 and brought before Margaret Thatcher and detailed two containment facilities where they were storing the nastiest bug. But like when the CDC was eradicating <coughs> smallpox from the face of the earth, not the CDC, the World Health Organization, in conjunction with like the CDC and its counterparts internationally. I'm going to beer. Um, <laughs> 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 Well, yeah, what they did was, times, the way they categorized these things and stored them was they would take the scabs off the death victims, and they would send them to two repositories, one in Atlanta, one in Switzerland, and then they would examine them. The nastiest of the nasties, the nastiest of the nasties were stolen and went to Russia. And they did this process where they figured out how you grow it, make a, a soup out of it, you know? And once they grew the most virile of smallpox, they took a bacteria, and smallpox was grown inside of the bacteria, and then it was rolled in ultra-pulverized glass as a delivery methodology. It was called the Hunter Program, and what this would allow it to do was, upon dispersion and ingested, it took two weeks for the bacteria to gestate, and then you'd go through a sickness. And upon going through the sickness, it would release the smallpox virus into your body. By that time, it's traversed the globe. And the way the CDC and the health organization set up inoculation rings around every single smallpox outbreak would no longer be possible because people were infected for weeks before they got sick, and it, and it made it impossible to set up inoculation rings. Well, two 25-ton tanks... Margaret Thatcher went before, you know, the 
the international board of rule and said, we need to go to Russia. So the United States, every, everybody in Europe, we all went to Russia and said, let us in, we want to see. And by the time when they got there, both 25-ton tanks were, were drained. They found the empty tanks. And that stuff is gone, and it's on the open market, or it's stored, or something. But it only takes a teaspoonful of this stuff wafting into the wind in New York City to take it down. That's great. And that's a true story. Wow. And that's where Carl gets his inspiration. <laughs> Let me just wrap that up for you, because I just I think I grew a beard. <laughs> I did. That wasn't too bad. I thought it was real interesting. <laughs> if you want to hear all that, girl, you're gonna need like a weekend. <laughs> now, now, whereas those albums were concept albums, the new album, The Little Ghost, was a little looser, a little freer for you. Do you see yourself in the future going back to concept al albums, or do you like having more lyrical freedom on an album? Well, after learning how, that we have to do this stuff live and have to remember all this crap from here on out, it's baby, baby, all night long. <laughs> We're going with the simple things. You guys are going to write the next Justin Bieber album. Exactly. Baby, baby. Oh, All right. Now, now, here's one I think you guys are going to have fun with. Starting with Captain Amazing here. I was <laughs> no, awesome. Captain Awesome. Or you can, call me, you can call me General uh, General Coolness, too. That works. <laughs> General Coolness? I want, you, I want you to look at the band member to your right and tell me one special thing he brings into the band. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm the person to the right. So, so you got Carl Cadden. Wait, well, he doesn't know which side his right is. Go that way. No, no, no. Uh, the one special thing that Carl brings into the band is the world's stinkiest feet. <laughs> Actually, no. Carl brings into the band a a social and political outlook that I did not understand existed, and enlightens me in in a very positive way in my younger years so that's that's what he brought in the band for me carl you got mr joe over there um i'm glad i get joe um, <laughs> that's what she said <laughs> <laughs> it is my lucky night <laughs> uh, i firmly believe the basis for any great musical ensemble begins at the drums and Joe's just the greatest. I, I stand there in awe and amazement while I'm wow, sitting there thanks. playing. And uh, as a bass player, um, it is so uh, comforting to know that my drummer is just going to be right on. So I feel like uh, very, very blessed to have an amazing drummer like support everything else. It just makes everything else around you better when the drums are great, and we have a great, great drummer. Good. Thank you. Wow. That's nice. And Joe, we have Mr. Workham. Mr. Workham? <laughs> you knew that was my last name. Uh, well, I, uh, well, Gary's, uh, well, like I say, he's real versatile. He's multi-talented, this guy, you know. Plays everything good. It's ADD. Good. Yeah. And he's, you know, great communicator, great person. Yeah, great to work. You work keep work. going. <laughs> it makes great Why don't we draw this segment out a little bit? Complications makes great coffee. <laughs> Congratulations, Gary. You make great, great coffee. Call. You could have just said that and left it at that. <laughs> great guitarist, great keyboardist, great Starbucks employee. Yeah, he plays drums really good, you know? Yeah, he like does. That. Gary is, uh, I'd put Gary up against anybody if, as far as multi-instrumentalist hey, goes. Hey, you your left, come on. You can't talk about me until I move over there. Why don't I move to the right of each of you and then we can do this again. <laughs> Here's the thing about Brent that people don't know. He's also very, very talented at so many different instruments. And um, it's, tough. it's tough when you have, well, first of all, here's another thing, thing about Brent. He's a type A personality. And Shadow Gallery is either blessed or cursed with three or more type A personalities that any one of us could run this ship very easily, you know, and at different times we all have. I think he's, I think he's signing me up for more work here. I, I, I'm trying to set the, pave the way for Brent. Um, but when he's off his phone, well, Brent brings a rudeness to the band. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's his lack of confidence. <laughs> he, he thinks 
like a musician, not a guitar player. He does so much of the drums, the drum programming, the keyboards. He's got great ideas. Uh, back in the day, people don't even know this, but he kind of took a lot of like, Chris Engel's piano solos and turned them into songs because he's always thinking about the song, giving it an entire angle. So he doesn't think like this. He thinks wide and deep. Keep going. Uh, <laughs> his best thing about him, though, is his ability to compromise. We we'll at that, especially when he disagrees with me or vice versa. I'm, I'm pretty sure this one can be directed at you, Gary. I, I know some people know the story. The bonus disc to Room 5 has something on it called Floydian Memories. And if you're lucky enough to have that version, you can get the story in there. But briefly, briefer than Carl can do, <laughs> can you give us the what inspired you to make a 25-minute Pink Floyd medley? All right, there's a very good answer behind that. Mike Baker and I were doing magazine interviews after... Um, Legacy came out, and we had a break from 10 to 11 o'clock. Usually, they're set up every half hour. Um, and then during that time, our European promotion manager called, and they said that the 12 and the 12:30 canceled due to total lack of interest. No, no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they did cancel, so we had we had a little bit of time, but we couldn't leave because we had more from 1:30. So I just happened to have a guitar. We were just kind of fooling around, playing some stuff. We were talking about Pigs on the Wing on the old 8-track, how they used to have a version of the song from the album Animals, and those two parts used to be joined together, but only on the 8-track. And we said, we should do this. Let's do our own version of that, put our own solo in the middle. And we started recording it right then and there, and right leading out of that song, I was like, you know, this is the same tempo and same key as Mother. So we just started singing it, and on the spot, we just kind of went into 15 Pink Floyd songs, and that's what you hear is almost exactly what we did. And Eventually, we, we needed an extra track, and we thought, what are we going to do? And, oh, let's do that. So we dug that up back up. Yeah, like I said, that is one of my favorite Shadow Gallery moments right there. I thought it was wonderfully done. Thanks. So um, if you guys don't mind, I just want a few questions about Mike Baker, if that's all right with all of you. Of course, sure. Okay. Um, he was the voice of Shadow Gallery since 1992, I believe. And uh, his vote... voice of Sorcerer. Yep, he sang with Sorcerer. Since, uh, so so he's been there from the beginning. So <laughs> since yep. 83, you can almost say he was part oh. of the band. Yep. And I, I, would, I would certainly say his voice, his, his vocals were some of the richest in progressive metal at uh, the time he was with us. And how did you guys decide to push on after his untimely passing? Well, from, what, you know what <coughs> Well, it was a... Uh, none of us wanted to do anything after that because you know what our one of our buddies were gone and it really for me anyway instilled a sense of uh mortality in me that i never had before i was like wow this guy wasn't very wasn't older than me not that much older than me anyway and uh things are you know life is short right so we had most if not all of the album written uh, and we were just getting ready to record it and I remember Gary me, Gary telling me, and, and as well as Mike, you know, how excited he was to do this record. He wanted to do this record really, really bad, you know. So to lay that down and just put it away would have been just a travesty. So we took a couple months off to just get our heads straight, figure out what we're going to do, if we were going to go forward with that or not. Um, and after a lot of, you know, introspection... We decided we wanted to keep going because, you know, Mike would have called us idiots if we didn't. So that's how we uh, decided to keep going. Now, look, looking back now, with you guys heading on the road, and this doesn't have to be a Shadow Gallery song, but if you could choose one song to play live with Mike that you think Mike would have <laughs> loved to do with you guys, what would it be? <laughs> I'll tell you right now. Uh, I started recording a a version of light, A Light in the Black from Rainbow Rising. And uh, I was on the phone with Mike talking about it. He was super psyched to do it, you know. It was like a really heavy double bass tuned down to, you know, low D. And and uh, it was going to be great. The fit was perfect. And uh, But after he passed away, I just put it away. I said, that's, you know, that's something I was going to do with Mike, so no, I'm not going to do that. But I would do that. That's the tune I would do. Good. And um, now with, with Digital Ghost Finish, as we start to talk about that album, what do you think Mike would have been most proud of about that record? Haunted. Yeah. He was haunted. haunted. He yeah. was so into that song. I never heard him more excited in, in my entire life. He couldn't wait to get started on it. And this was 
you know, October, September, October. Yeah, I would I would say you know that tune. You know, I, I know that a lot of those vocal lines kind of Carl knew Mike's voice better than any of us because he worked most with him, and those were right in his range and everything was exactly. I know he was writing it for Mike to sing it. Yeah. So, I think he would have loved that one. All right, now the new album, Digital Ghosts, of course, came out last year, and that is what you'll be touring to support here. Fantastic record. When Thank you. did the work on that begin? Um, for Digital Ghosts? For Digital Ghosts. Like two years ago, right? Yeah, <laughs> no more or than something. that. Something? A lot more than that. Uh, Venom. You started oh, writing the yeah. music for that and right after Room 5. Uh, right, like I wrote, Two months after Room 5 came exactly, out. Yeah, that's right. I wrote Venom, uh, yeah, Venom right started. after that. <coughs> and um, hmm. then little by little, probably a year, a year or two after that, next year, 2008, a lot of the music was started. You get to tell Nick about the, the song Digital Ghost, how that one came about. Do I know the answer to that? Yeah, he, he doesn't know the answer to that because he's put his... Oh, the, on. yeah, the, the riff that couldn't go away. <laughs> yeah, 96, I wrote a piano thing, and it was hey. jazzy, progressive, and it you know it was just before we were doing Tyranny, and then we were trying to come up with ideas, and once we had the concept idea for Tyranny, Carl kind of had a, a vision of the storyline already. So it was great because it led us down a path, but it also kind of put other things that were not in the path you know, down for the future. And this was a piece that didn't fit on that. And then when it came time to Legacy, it would be demoed it again, it didn't fit on that. And then Room 5, it demoed it again, it didn't fit on that. So we've been trying, and when we needed one more song, you know, right. I said, hey, how about that song Remember that, that, jazzy <laughs> that we always uh, try to do thing. something with? And right. Um, right. so we took a few parts, and then Brent added a whole bunch of magic, and Brent turned that into... That was fun. A, a great song. Wrote that whole intro and jazzed up the jazzier parts at the end. And uh, yeah, so yeah, it was just a piano uh, fusion. fusion, fusion, jazz thing. fusion, rock fusion, whatever thing with the piano. All the all the solo section basically is where that that song started with the solo section. Yeah. So that was kind of fun to go back and start from the crazy stuff instead of the other way around. Yeah. Usually it's like, I, or usually I'll come up with just a a main riff or some theme or something or a chorus or something like that and then just fill in the rest of it afterwards but this one started with the crazy stuff and we built a song around the crazy stuff which uh, never happens but now it has now it has and I want to do it again good now how far into Digital Ghost were you guys uh, writing recording wise when Brian came into the fold we had, did we? We were done. Yeah, we were, we almost, had almost all we were of the. Done writing. Yeah, we were done, all the, done with all the writing. Most of the recording was we underway. Did the, we did the drums and we started doing guitars when we were courting Brian. <laughs> yeah, right. So courting Brian to come do, do the record and we, while we were recording. This is how much faith you got to have, you know, that like God's going to put you in the right direction because we went, kept going recording the record. Without a singer. Without a singer. We were just going to figure it out. You know, some way, one way or another, yeah. we were going to do it. And uh, I think the story of Brian Joint has been told a lot, but, you know, it, thankfully it, it worked out at the right time. As I said before, you know, God likes us. He puts us the right people in the right places at the right time for us. So we're, uh, we're blessed that way. And, and how did, how did, how was it for Brian coming into that situation? Was he able to gel quickly? Did you guys, were, were you able to work with him quickly and well? Well, Carl worked with him both, so you, you probably want to answer that. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, um, after working with Mike since 83, I was really weirded out my first vocal session with Brian, and, uh, um, two things, um, his personality and my personality when collaborating in the recording process work, he meshed really well with me. And, uh, um, like, uh, I'm a leader type as a producer. Uh, he didn't butt heads with me. He was very respectful. Um, and um, the second thing was that when he did have input, it was input of value. You know, his ideas, I thought, were really, really good. And after my first session with him, I was very excited to do the next one, and, and from there on out, we had a great time. It was so much fun recording, you know. It was like nonstop laughing. Back in one second, he's joking. He won't be missed. But and he's awesome singer, 
you know, the kind of person I can give direction to, the, the type of um, <coughs> detailed direction that I think a lot of people don't get, you know, um, but he totally got it, uh, and uh, really, I thought he did an amazing job, and I loved working with him, and I love hanging out with him, we have a lot of fun, he's a hilarious, intelligent, very funny, funny dude, funny dude, good. Now, aside from him I, and some instrumental guests on the album, you also had Clay Barton and uh, Ralph Sheepers do uh, tracks. How was it working with them, and how did you decide what they were going to sing? Well, um, Clay, Gary brought to the table, um, and uh, I thought that uh, um, the piece that we wanted to use him on... Um, That's a funny story. Voice. Yeah, his voice was great. Was like perfect for the part, you know. Like to me, that's a that song is a play, you know, and it's a story, story, uh, more than most songs would ever be a story, you know. And I thought he did such a good job, such a believable job of uh, like being the character, you know. So, like when I'm looking for guest vocalists to do stuff like that, I'm. I'm looking for that character to come out, you know. Yeah, but he was originally going to sing your part. I know. He did it so well. But when when it flipped, yeah. it, it was that was right. That's how it should have been. Yeah. You know. So we ended up giving him the bigger part because he did so well in the smaller he part. Was yeah. Than me. Uh, bottom line, Clay was so good. We just said we need to have him sing more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's too small the part. It's too good to sing twenty words. He needs to sing a hundred. Yeah. yeah. Much better singer than I am. Now, um, on the album, you have the song Gold Dust, and that ended up being a video you guys shot. How did you guys go about deciding on that song for the video, and what was it like for you guys to actually shoot that video? It wore me out. <laughs> I was, was tired. It was probably the most, uh, I don't know, commercially uh, driven song. So if for somebody to be introduced to Shadow Gallery or something for the first time, it probably would be the best thing to kind of grab them that was new and modern for us. Um, we planned on doing two videos, and that was going to be the first one, and uh, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. You know, I think w once we were on stage at the Sherman Theater, faking it, you know, we was like, I think it really kind of led us all to believe, hey, we can do this. We should, we should go all the way with this. We shouldn't just do a video. We should, you know, really get out there and do this. Good. And um, now, generally, I've seen positive reviews for Digital Ghosts, but I'm sure from your guys' perspective, things can be taken a little differently. Have you guys been happy with how the, the album's been received? Yes. Very much. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, it's it's awesome to see, you know, some of the things that people have to say about all the stuff we've done, and, and I think, again, we, we're blessed to have a lot of really good press. You know, that's the one thing that sold records for us <coughs> ages ago before the internet, you know, was, was popular and whatnot, so... And you're our favorite guy we've ever interviewed with. Absolutely. And that's how we best, get the good man. press. <laughs> <laughs> Pandering will get you everywhere. Exactly. I, I'll tell you, I, some of my favorite reviews, though, are, the, are, are a couple of negative ones that I read. And those are those are always entertaining. Entertaining, if nothing else. Oh, yeah. It just cracks me up. So. Um. It's all right if somebody calls your dog ugly, you know? Yeah. <laughs> now, now, we're going to get to the fun stuff here. We've got the live shows coming up. And um, is, is there anyone in the band, first off, that before these live shows came out for years now, is there anyone that's been tugging at your guys' arms? One guy in the band, like, let's get out on the road, let's get out on the road, or? Gary. Gary's always wanted to do it. Yeah, actually, we've, we've always, we've all, we've always all wanted, wanted to do it. it. It's just no, that it never really worked out for us the way we needed it to work out, you know, with, with different, um, you know, the situations that we've been in and, and our family situations and job situations and all that kind of stuff because let's face it i mean we even if we if we toured non-stop you know all year long i'm not going to make enough, as much money as i do in my job doing that I and mean, that's just the bottom line yeah you know you gotta be realistic look at oh yeah you know your like, family and I'm, all that and sure. i enjoy my lifestyle i like to keep it <laughs> But now we do have your first live show. It's going to be in Tannersville, Pennsylvania on September 5th. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of friends and family on the show. For people who don't know, you are from eastern Pennsylvania here. Um, based out of Allentown for the first many years of the band. And um, on top of that, though, you're going to have a lot of fans from around the U.S. I'm sure traveling in, hardcore fans. We hope so. And what's it going to be like playing to all those people for the very first time? A relief. 
<laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's going to be a, a nice payoff for a lot of work. Uh, you know, getting ready to do this has been a big, you know, major uh, undertaking. Um, because we kind of, you know, agreed to that we were going to do this, but when we were going back relearning some of these songs, it's like, wow, we really put a lot of things into this. We're going to need 15 people in the band. Thank God Gary plays 900 instruments. Yes. Um, <laughs> we're now, I believe, exactly two weeks out from that first show. How confident are all you guys in getting up there on the stage two weeks from now? Highly. I, I can't wait. Be. I wish it was tomorrow. I'll be confident two weeks from now. <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted to get here and be able to... No, I don't want to get here. I mean, well, I just, we just want to put on the best show we can. Okay, fair enough. Now, with the um, large amount of, a lot of vocal work in the band, obviously, would you say it's been equally challenging perfecting that as it has just been the instrumental end of things? More it's challenging. Yeah. We have to sing almost nonstop overlapping parts sometimes. and uh, yeah, We need 15 people singing. So we're trying to sing like we're more people than we are. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. There's a reason why a lot of bands don't do the harmonies that they do on the record. Yeah. It's because it's effing hard to do. <laughs> it's not easy doing three and four part harmonies, man. I can't wait to do it, though. Now, I obviously don't want you to give anything about the set list away, but how, how deep are you guys planning to dig for these shows? Are you going all the way back to the debut album? It's a tune from every record. Deep cuts, yeah. Yep, so tune from every record. Hardcore fans will be very satisfied then with... That is correct. We, we There's going to be some surprises, too. Now, we're... We're many records in here, and you guys are just about to play your first show. How do you guys go back through all that material and pick out these few songs that are going to be the lucky ones to get played at that first show? A lot of arm wrestling. <laughs> I think we just picture it on stage, what's going to you know, be the most energetic and, and come across live. It's, it's pretty easy to tell you know, like a lot of soft ballad pieces in, a, in a, an aggressive environment on a stage you know, with other bands even. You know, we're not going to get up there and play the really soft stuff. We're going to show that side of ourselves, obviously, but we're going to come out and try to rock you. Okay. Tonight, we're going to rock you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> How do we move on from that? Yeah. Now, of course, you're going to have a good many people here in Pennsylvania, but not long after that, you guys are going to be looking to headline Prog Power Europe. How intimidating is that? It wasn't until you just said it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Headlining Prog Power is intimidating? Yeah. Is it? I don't know. No, it's not it? intimidating. No. Nah, I can't wait for it, man. It's going to be awesome. As long as they get the rider correctly, I want all my candies and all my scotch. You didn't even turn that stuff in. Oh, damn it. All your shots? Scotch. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Now, it's going to be awesome, man. How could it not be awesome? It's going to be awesome. I can't wait. Good. Cannot wait. Now, we, we, he's haven't hit the stage officially yet, but once he's due, who do you, you think is going to be the biggest ham up there? Who, who can we expect to be? Carl. Uh, I would hope Brian. That's his job. Carl. <laughs> It'll be Carl. In his assless chaps. <laughs> you know, there's going to be some disappointed people now. <laughs> <laughs> we, just, we just took our attendance down. <laughs> Uh, now, along with just getting the music right, when you go out on your first tour here, there's going to be production, there's going to be lights, there's going to be all that kind of things. How bogged down are you guys getting all that stuff together on top of the music? Mm. We're going to put on a show, but we're, we're our main focus is the music. Okay. Um, how, how many of you guys have performed live before outside of Shadow Gallery? Is it something you guys have done regularly? Oh, we've all done yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, we've all sure, done it. Okay. And, and how do you think it's going to be different from playing live before and now with Shadow Gallery? I'm sorry. Just music. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're older. We're older and the music is... Uh, this is this is going to be some of the most complicated stuff I've ever done in front of people. That's for that's for yeah. sure. And that, that goes for playing, you yes. know, jazz standards and all sorts of other crazy stuff that I end up doing in other places. And, and this is much more complicated than any of that. Yeah. And I mean that in a... In a not boisterous way. I mean it in a man. I really got to pay attention to what the hell I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know. Now, when you guys head over to Europe, is there any uh, venues, cities, or countries that you guys are looking forward to playing? Anything special to you guys that you're just excited to go over there and see? Gonna call out favorites here, huh? 
Uh, I'm excited <laughs> to go to Greece. I'm excited to go to Greece. We've had yeah. great support there for so many years. I mean, people have just been terrific uh, to us all over Europe for for so long now. Uh, but we've we've remained a lot of we've had a lot of close contacts with Greece, you know, years and years ago. And wow. What about you? Well, where do I, where would I like to fly? Yeah, or? where are you excited about? I'm excited about the whole tour. I'm excited about being in all those countries. This is great. I'm looking forward to it. Very diplomatic answer. Yeah, it's, yeah, but how can you not feel that way? You know? Yeah, it's going to be pretty badass. It's nice. I mean, you're going... Everywhere we're going. Everywhere. You know, yeah, every, we're excited about everywhere. And we're going to give them gonna give them all their money's worth. It's, it's not like you're playing your first few shows just here around Pennsylvania. It's another thing when you're doing your first tour and you're getting to see so much of Europe. Yes, we're leaving yeah. Pennsylvania and going to Europe. Oh, you brought in pencil tucky. That's exactly where we are. I was, I was we hoping are. that would be a word people would forget about. And <laughs> here you've used it. <laughs> it's, what my, it's what my dad calls it. Okay. So, down in Texas, so that's it's in my mind. It's not pencil tucky until you get west of Schuylkill County. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, didn't, I don't know the political parts of it. <laughs> Having rehearsed now for a little bit, what, what do you think is going to be special live? What, what do you think, someone who's listened to the records, what are they going to be in awe about when they see the live show? What's going to have an added dimension? If, I think it's just what I said a bit a second ago. A lot of bands that play this kind of music, or just music in general, they don't attempt the, the hard stuff. I'm not trying to build it up too much, but, I mean, if there's a harmony on the record, we're going to try our best to pull it off. You know? Yeah. So I think that's going to be, you know, the thing, I, that's the big draw for me. That's I think the they're going to enjoy Dro- Joe's... Uh, Drumming a lot too. Oh yeah, Joe's out of hand. Solo, out of I'm hand little, drum solo. Maybe, we might let him do a little solo. Times. <laughs> <laughs> Lost and patience. I like that word. There'll be like some <laughs> show. There'll be a lot of showmanship from behind the drum yeah, set. Yeah, a little bit. I think we should count the number of times that Joe's twirls his. Well, sticks. don't do that. Don't do that. I'll try. I it. think I think we should have a contest to see how he's many still people. working on twirling. Yeah, he's gonna twirling. do it. The last song he's gonna try to do a twirl. <laughs> so we'll, keep your eyes we'll, up. we'll set up a contest where anyone over 21 can enter, take a shot every time he twirls a stick. Last man standing gets a meet and greet with the band. Oh, well, there you go. Not gonna make it to the second song. <laughs> yeah, you have alcohol, alcohol poisoning <laughs> after one tune. That's just funny. Although I, I'm willing to take that bet. Yeah, me too. <laughs> How would you guys define success for this tour? Is it the number of fans that come out, the reception of the fans there? What would be successful to you guys? Making it back alive. I, I think just getting, you know, being on the stage with, you know, I mean, I got just such an amazing respect for everybody in this band, individually and collectively, and just being on the stage in front of five people is just successful. Good. I mean, yeah, as, that, long, as long as we do good, that'll be success. You know, as long as we go out there and we're a good band, don't leave anything on the stage. <laughs> are, are you guys of the mindset here that this tour will determine what you do in the future, or are you already kind of set on we're going to keep trying to tour in the future, or this could be it? Or, where does this tour stand in the future of Shadow Gallery? It remains to be seen. Yeah, it's tough to say because I mean, there's a lot of different things going on in a lot of people's lives, but. If we can do it once, we can probably do it twice. Okay. We only got a few more here for you. We're past the live shows. I just want to hear from everyone. What is your personal favorite Shadow Gallery song or songs? Jeez. Wow. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm making you think your favorite child. Well, I love Mystery. I, I love that song. It's a beautiful song. I think what defines this band is just that they have, just, they have great melodies. You know, there's great melodies, but yet interesting music too the musicianship and the, the uh, just the way it's put together it's just great oh boy um, say goodbye to the morning Queen of the City of Ice anything else off the first album and <laughs> is there some reason you're partial to that album? <laughs> I, you know, probably because I can as an outsider appreciate it and I just think it's brilliant you know absolutely brilliant so anything off the first album? There was none of Gary's notes to spoil the. Yeah, maybe that might be it. I don't know. Maybe you guys are just better then. <laughs> <laughs> I already drums. told you what I, my favorites are. I like Vow and Haunted the best. Those are my. If I was going to show somebody what we sound like, those are the two songs I would pick. Vow may maybe get into my wedding one day, so I'm, I'm a big fan of that song too. I am too, man. I love the hell out of that tune. I really do. What about you, Carl? Um, I like New World Order, Chased, and Ghost of a Chance. Those three songs, right in a row. 
This is this stuff. Remember my favorite. Good. Now, uh, this is a, a question I've promised to ask at every interview I ever do. Hold on a second. On. What's your favorite two, two Shadow Gallery songs? I'm more interested in that. Andromeda Strain and The Archer of Ben Salem. Right on. You like the heavy. That's good. I, you got to have the heavy, man. It's, it's not that I prefer the heavy, but they're just two songs. That Room 5 was my first album. They were the two that I always latched onto the most. So Right on, brother. There you go. Now, future albums. This is a general question. Any plans to use the magical instrument, the Vuvuzela? What oh, exactly? well, of course. We plan on using that on every album. Of you know. course. Now, they're going to be very disappointed if we don't have that. The Vuvuzela? Isn't that a bubblegum uh, company? <laughs> bubblegum company? Oh, you guys didn't watch any of the, the World Cup, did you? Uh, no, I, I guess out. we didn't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> very, very, very annoying instrument. <laughs> we did. We watched... The beginning. Did, didn't the Flyers lose the World Cup? Oh, the World Cup. <laughs> oh, oh, you're going back places. Help me. Oh. <laughs> Trust God. me, it hurt me just as much. Yeah, All right. Sign away from the now that you, yeah, you, you, if you want to, yeah. Do you have, you have any questions for Joe? He's got a long, long drive. Joe, any final thoughts before you head out? No, I just, just. I'm looking forward to that, you know, to the show and the tour. I'm really looking forward to playing. I've been wanting this band to play for a long time. <laughs> yeah, Joe is partially... Uh, oh, Joe, Joe is directly responsible. Directly responsible <laughs> yeah, yeah. for making this Remember happen. Remember at that uh, release party? Yeah, at the release party, Joe, Joe was very vocal at the release very party vocal. of making sure yeah, you guys... more than very vocal. Very buzzed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were buzzed. Very you were buzzed an hour before that, man. <laughs> I didn't even get any cake at that party. You did. You made cake at 2 a.m. I was trying to stop but you. But you did have a small what? salad and an entire bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> no, because you needed some nutrition. No, no. Right now. Joe, right. let's see. See you, man. Joe's All right, gotta I gotta go. go. I have a long drive, but oh. very nice. Hi, right, brother. All right. Good Thanks, job, Joe. Great weekend. Thank you, everyone else. Do you have any final thoughts for your fans? I'll see you Sunday. Final thoughts. Come yeah. to our shows. Right. It's going to be yeah, fun. this week, Joe. We, while we will not throw meat out on stage like Bar, we will. Uh, you will get to see Carl shake his tush. And it'll be fun. You can come to Pennsylvania and America, a bunch of places across Europe. Go see Shadow Gallery. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. What Nick said. Woo. Thank you, guys. That was fun. <laughs> Thank you.